Mousetrap, slab of wood, spring, hammer. You cannot evolve a mousetrap from a slab of wood. Mousetrap, slab of wood, and hammer. You cannot evolve from that a mousetrap, because a mousetrap doesn't catch any mice if it's just a slab of wood, or if it's a slab of wood and a hammer. It's irreducibly complex. You have to have the slab of wood, the spring, and the hammer. Well, it's the same with the eye. If something's missing out of the eye, it ain't gonna work. And there's so many parts of the eye that are necessary in order for an eye to be an eye, it can't go from one little stage to another. Now, the, the classic example is the living cell. See, a living cell is not, it, a living cell is irreducibly complex. It can't go from one stage to another stage to another stage and then suddenly become a living cell. It's irreducibly complex. When uh, I brought like those passages where Paul says like women can't teach or women shouldn't have authority, you know, women should cover their heads. Yeah. He said, you know, that's he was just talking to those specific people. That was his reason. But, like in First Timothy, like Paul says, like women should learn quietly and submissively. I do not let women teach men or have authority over them. Let them listen quietly. And then the reason that he gives for that has nothing to do with people in the specific church that he's talking to. His reason is for God made Adam first and afterward he made Eve. And it wasn't Adam who was deceived by Satan. The woman was deceived and sin was the result. But women will be saved through childbearing, assuming they continue to live in faith, love, holiness, and modesty. Like to me, that doesn't say like, oh, this is just for these people. Like he gives the reason. It has nothing to do with a specific instance. It has to do with Eve is an idiot and she caused this huge problem of sin. So this is their punishment. You honestly think that Paul writing at the end of 1 Timothy chapter two, that women are gonna be saved through childbearing you honestly think that no, that is I a don't universal prescription he that he's making? You know better than that. What point, what point do you think he's making by bringing He's that obviously up? dealing with a very specific problem that Timothy is dealing with as a young pastor in the city of Ephesus. And in Ephesus, we learn in Acts that they worship Diana of the Ephesians, a goddess. So they're into pantheism, they're into mother, mother earth worship, they're into goddess worship, and Timothy is really in a jam trying to figure out how to straighten out a really chaotic situation and Paul is writing very specifically that women will be saved through childbearing not meaning by that that the way to heaven is to have babies ladies that's tribal patriarchalism that's not what Paul was teaching instead he's saying the Gnostic thought that the body's evil and that childbearing condemns you to hell or is evil is baloney women will be saved even as they bear children even as they bring children into the world so you got to figure out in 1 Timothy chapter 2, what on earth is he addressing? The same way in 1 Corinthians, but when he first, begins 1 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 7 with the words, it is better for a man not to marry, what on earth is he addressing? You better study that, and you better not build a whole view on difficult passages of the Bible. That's intellectually dishonest. But in 1 Corinthians, after he talks to you, he goes on this huge spiel on how women should cover their head because it's a sign of authority under men. Afterwards, he says... Um, if anyone wants to argue about this, you know, like you're doing, you're saying like, no, he wasn't talking about everyone. Um, it says, I simply say that we have no other custom than this and neither do God's other churches. Like, aren't you a part of that? Like God's other churches. That's what he's saying is if anybody wants to argue about this and say, this isn't legit. I say, this is the only custom we know. And this is for all of God's churches. Are you exempt from that? Paul had Aquila and Priscilla teach Apollos. I'm not talking about examples of how he I'm talking about what he says right here. He yeah, says obviously women should cover their he heads. contradicts what he's saying there in the way he treats women. Oh, yeah. He had a woman, Priscilla, teach the great apostle, the great preacher, Apollos, how to teach. Now, why is woman valuable from your worldview? They're humans. Yeah, what are humans? Uh, keep, keep going. No, you're, it's your turn. <laughs> Why are women valuable according to your worldview? I'm not view? making the point that women are valuable. I'm making the point that biblically women have less value than men, and that that's what Paul's saying. I don't believe that, but I think that's what Paul's saying. Sir, if there is no God, you're up a creek without a paddle when it comes to explaining to me why woman is valuable. Why well, man that's, is that's, valuable. That's a good point. That's what I'm talking about. I'm saying, okay, Paul, you can say he had these women in authority, but then why did he go out and say, oh, but they're submissive to men, and they should like wear a head covering to show that they're submissive. And I'm saying this to all churches everywhere. 
How can you say he's only talking to this one church, addressing this one specific problem? No, he's not just talking to one church. In Timothy, he's talking to the church in Ephesus. In Corinthians, he's talking to the church in Corinth, okay? He's speaking into a cultural situation where women who have been abused and marginalized are being given new dignity and freedom in Christ, and they're abusing that freedom. And so he's pleading for order in worship in Corinthians, and he's pleading for a sane view of sexuality and childbearing, and how to deal with the Mother Earth, the Diana the Ephesians issue in 1 Timothy chapter 2. He's dealing with specific issues, but he has women in, as partners in ministry. He does not demean women. In Galatians 3.28, he writes, In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ. Now, it's a difficult issue. So is the slavery issue. And he writes very clearly, slaves obey your masters. Now, you rip that out of context, and you got white Christian slaveholders using the Bible, Paul, to justify slavery. The only problem is, when you go to Philemon, he's pleading with a slave owner, Philemon, to accept the runaway slave Onesimus back, no longer as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. So you've got to realize Paul is dealing with an incredibly sexist culture, with a culture filled with slavery. Obviously, an incredibly high number of, of people in the Roman Empire were slaves. And he's saying, gradually, we're going to knock the crud out of sexism. We're going to knock the crud out of slavery, but it's going to take a while. And here are the steps. Now, all you've got to do is go to Matthew chapter 19. And the Pharisees say, hey, well, then why, Jesus? If God doesn't want people to divorce, why did God... Why did Moses say, just write a certificate of divorce? And Jesus says, God, that was not God's intention from the start, but because your hearts were hard, Moses said, if you're going to divorce your wife, give her a certificate of divorce. Not meaning by that that divorce is good, but because of the hardness of your hearts. It's another difficult passage. Uh, can you prove to me God exists? And sure. Paul, can you uh, prove to me that the Christian God is, quote, unquote, the right God? You bet. I will, prove, I will prove to you that God exists if you first prove to me that I'm not just a bad dream you're having right now. I can't prove that. Thank you. I will prove to you that God exists if you first prove to me that your taste buds tell you the truth that the milk is sour. Can you prove that? can't prove that. I will prove to you that God exists if you first prove to me that your eyesight really perceives reality. Can you prove that? can't prove it. Thank you. Now why what on earth are you say? doing asking me to prove God exists? Because you know there's no way... Okay. There's no way that I could ever prove that God exists. It's Can you impossible. give me a good argument for it without using the Bible or quoting Jesus? You bet. Thank you. Great. Yes, I can answer the question. What is the evidence, not the proof, okay. but the evidence that God exists? The evidence that God exists, I'll give you 11 pieces of evidence, okay? okay. First one, order and design point to an intelligent mind. The order and design of the cosmos points to an intelligent mind. How? You and I are standing at the foot of Mount Rushmore. As okay. we're standing there, I turn to you and say, hey, isn't it incredible the way the water just dripped over the rock face? Hey, it's George Washington up there. Wow, it's Teddy Roosevelt. Isn't it amazing the way the water, by accident, just carved out those heads on Mount Rushmore? It doesn't show anything. Yeah, it, shows. it just shows that there's like we happen to be an intelligent byproduct of evolution. No, you don't get order and design by chance, sir. Order and design point to a designer. Designer genes demand a designer. This guy's good. He's good. Uh, I don't like him, but he's good. All right. It's very um. simple. <laughs> Second point. The universe is eternal. No, it's not. There's a big bang. Okay. So the universe is not eternal. The universe has a beginning. Everything that has a beginning has a cause. The universe has a beginning, therefore the universe has a cause. The best explanation is an uncaused cause. That's God. Mm -hmm. Third piece of evidence for God's existence, the anthropic principle. Life is balanced on a razor's edge. There are so many ingredients that go into allowing this earth to sustain life. But it ain't no accident, sir. It's got to be an intelligent mind. If the Earth was a little closer to the sun, we'd all fry. If the Earth was a little further from the sun, we'd all freeze. Well, I mean, the galaxy is huge. I mean, chance says that, like, there will be a terrestrial planet at some point. 
that just happens to be in the right location that's perfectly around the sun and like... Point four, the amount of information densely packed in the DNA of a single cell demands an intelligent mind. Every time you are confronted by densely packed information, there's got to be an intelligent mind when I feel like three of the points you've given me are just like astronomical odds and you're just quoting God as proof because like it's just an easy way out. Why'd you use the word proof? No. Proof. I, um, evidence. Evidence. There we go. Good. This is really good. Fifth point. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't like it. Charles Darwin pointed out that if something is irreducibly complex, the whole idea of evolution by chance and fate falls apart. I think there are more than enough evidence, more than enough examples of things that are irreducibly complex, as Michael Behe points out, the biochemist at Lehigh. Irreducible complexity shows that you cannot go from this stage to this stage to this stage to this stage, because in between, if those state, if that is missing, that never happens. What? Mousetrap, slab of wood, spring, hammer. You cannot evolve a mousetrap from a slab of wood. Mousetrap, slab of wood, and hammer. You cannot evolve from that a mousetrap, because a mousetrap doesn't catch any mice if it's just a slab of wood, or if it's a slab of wood and a hammer. It's irreducibly complex. You have to have the slab of wood, the spring, and the hammer. Well, it's the same with the eye. If something's missing out of the eye, it ain't gonna work. And there's so many parts of the eye that are necessary in order for an eye to be an eye, it can't go from one little stage to another. Now, the, the classic example is the living cell. See, a living cell is not, it, a living cell is irreducibly complex. It can't go from one stage to another stage to another stage and then suddenly become a living cell. It's irreducibly complex. Sixth piece of evidence for God's existence is moral absolutes. The slaughter of innocent children is never good. It is always wrong. Well, so you're saying that there's a universal moral conduct or standard? I'm saying that there are ab moral absolutes. Okay. The only way there can be is if there's a God, the creator. If there is no God, it's all relative. A, a moral absolute, you said that the children, to, I, I'm sorry, what you Slaughter of innocent children is absolutely evil. Okay, well, what about the uh, the rape and selling of innocent children? Is that morally com completely like evil as well? Because I can point to uh, numerous accounts, numerous occasions where parents are sold by their own children. You know, they're they're sold into slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, I'm from Toledo, which is known as like apparently last week uh, I was told by a group that Toledo has a lot of uh, uh, human trafficking in the area and Very I say sad. that like that is morally like wrong and mm -hmm. I agree but I never went to a church I think it's wrong to sell people because you're born with not a God given right for freedom but a, a given right by the government okay, if we were born if we were totally born in, 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 in Arabia totally relevant. I am not standing out here talking about churches or religion this gentleman asked me what's your evidence for the existence of God Six point is, moral absolutes demand a moral lawgiver. Now, if you believe there are no moral absolutes, you're a moral relativist, then I don't have a point to make. Okay, then, point seven. Okay? But I think every atheist friend of mine has moral absolutes. Because every atheist friend of mine looks into, the per per person of the, looks into the face of the person who abuses children and says, you should not have abused that child. And when my atheist friend uses the word should, they're appealing to a standard outside of us and acting as if it's real. And the only way it can be real is if there is some God to create and to fight it. Or society. Seventh piece of evidence for the existence of God is love. Our experience of love tells us that there is more to reality than simple matter and energy. There's this innate human being ability that we people have to genuinely care. Eighth piece of evidence is that where we're at, eight? Right. Eighth piece of evidence is rational minds. Your rational mind points to a rational God. Why? 
because it's preposterous to believe that the rational comes from the non-rational. It's ludicrous to believe that the rational comes from the irrational. And that's why Charles Darwin in 1883 wrote a letter to a man named Mr. Graham in which he writes, if it's true that our minds are simply highly developed monkeys' minds, why do we trust them to tell us the truth about reality? Would you trust the thoughts of a monkey? He's struggling with epistemological nihilism. You can't know anything because your mind is an accident. It comes from the irrational. No, your mind is not an accident. Your mind is so complex, it's amazing. It's far more reasonable to believe that your mind comes from a rational being than it is to believe that your mind comes from the irrational. Ninth piece of evidence. You as a human being have an innate drive for meaning in life. You're always attaching meaning to your life, so are we all. The only way there can be meaning is if there is a God who created you for a purpose. No God, life is ultimately meaningless. <laughs> I mean, what if someone says there is no meaning to life or like then I have nothing to say but you know what you know what you know what you got to be doing okay if life is meaningless you got to be committing suicide because your life is totally insignificant I've heard this argument okay yeah, well Camus made the argument okay Camus said Albert Camus the great French atheistic existential philosopher said the only question modern man must answer is why not commit suicide now maybe you're going to choose not to fine but if you're going to genuinely tell me that you don't believe God exists, but you've never seriously considered suicide, you're not being intellectually consistent and honest. That's Camus' point. I agree with him, totally. Oh, you're good. Okay, so what's the point of a God? Like, See, if you the innate in drive God, for meaning in life is an indicator that God is left within you and within me. You're created for a purpose, and you have this innate drive for meaning and purpose in life. But where does that drive come from? Is there anything to satisfy that drive? Tenth piece of evidence for the existence of God <laughs> is the historical resurrection of Jesus Christ. The historical evidence is he really died, he was really buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, his followers dispersed in despair and disillusionment. Three days later, he appeared risen from the dead over a period of 40 days to over 500 people who saw him at different times, in different places, risen from the dead. So those are 10 pieces of evidence, not proof, evidence that God exists. That's what, why I believe God exists. What was the 11th one? I forget. <laughs> there are a slew of other ones, but... All right, here's the 11th one. For me? <laughs> because. Because I've never seen life come from non-life. And do you know what an atheist is believing? An atheist is someone who believes life comes from non-life. You talk about a blind leap of faith, that has got to be the biggest blind leap of faith I could ever imagine. To believe that life comes from non-life is incredible. Why? Because all of my observation tells me <laughs> plant life comes from plant life, animal life comes from animal life, human life comes from human life. You never once get the animate from the inanimate. Never. But an atheist is someone who says, oh yeah, but, but there's one exception to all of this, Cliff. In the beginning, life comes from non-life. That's incredible that you could be so naive to believe that. Because all of your experience is life comes from life. Never one time in your experience do you see life come from non-life. Never. Right? Um, how do you feel um, about babies that are created because of rape and the woman's choice to abort the rape baby or not? I don't know. Kind of okay, good question. What about abortion? Is abortion right or is abortion wrong? Well, to be honest with you, the Bible never uses the word abortion. The Bible never says abortion is wrong. So, the question is more difficult, more complex. The scriptures clearly communicate that murder is wrong. Not killing, but murder. So what is murder? Murder is ending a human life motivated by selfishness, hatred, revenge. So the question obviously then regarding abortion becomes, when does a human life begin? Now according to the simplest definition of human life, agreed upon in every major 
medical center in the United States. If a body lying on an intensive care unit bed has brain activity and heartbeat, doctors and nurses are ethically, legally responsible to do everything within their power to sustain that life. Between four to six weeks after conception, the quote little piece of skin, unquote, has both brain activity and heartbeat. So I think hopefully the majority of us can agree that between four to six weeks after conception, due to the existence of brain activity and heartbeat, that's a life. But what about before four to six weeks? Is that a human life? Well, what's the difference between a four-minute-old fertilized egg, a four-week-old fertilized egg, and a 40-year-old fertilized egg? There is no difference in kind. There is only a difference in degree of maturation. That is why I would argue a four-minute-old fertilized egg is a human life the same way a four-week-old fertilized egg is, the same way a 40-year-old fertilized egg is. It is simply a difference in degree of maturity, of maturation. That is why I obviously am strongly opposed to abortion because I view it as murder. But what about if that egg was fertilized as a result of rape? Well, obviously that's horrible. Obviously that's evil, rape. But I would plead for the woman to bring that child into the world and if necessary, give that child up for adoption. Why? Because I'm convinced that your value does not depend upon whether your mom and dad were in love when they conceived you. I am convinced that your value is innate, intrinsic. You're a human being created in the image of God. That is why you're valuable. So in the same breath that I talk against abortion, I have to talk for adoption, and I have to point out that Jesus Christ bled and died on a cross to forgive us for our sins. And a woman who's had an abortion, I can promise you, is no more guilty than I am for the sins that I've committed. When your professor marks on your exam wrong, has he lost his respect for you? Maybe a little bit. A little bit? Depends on what your answer He's is. He's a lousy professor. <laughs> If your professor respects you less because you get a B or a C than if you got an A, that's a sad professor. You gotta ask yourself, just because God grants me my request that I live my life separate from him and I spend eternity separate from him in hell, doesn't mean that God's disrespecting me. It means he respects my decision. I mean, if you live your life separate from God, why would you want to spend eternity with him in heaven? Why? You don't want to be with God, right? You want to live your life separate from God, and so he grants your request, and you spend eternity separate from him. That's what hell is. It's granting you what you ask for. Now, that's respect. Now, I think what you're really getting at is, wait a second, I don't like the consequence that God gives for my decision to reject him. But if he's the creator, then he created hell. If he created everything, then hell is the way he wanted it to be. A convenient okay. place to send people that don't agree with him. Okay, if God wants people to go to hell, then why did Jesus go through the hell of the cross so you and I could go to heaven? It's not wants people, but it's a place to put people. Wait a second, he may not want you to go to hell, but he might respect. But he, if he respects your decisions, he still sends you there, and it's a place that you're created. I don't exactly. I don't. God doesn't send me to hell. I send myself to hell by choosing to live my life separate from God. But if I choose to not go to either, well, I'm sorry, you don't have that option. And guess what? You didn't have the option to be born. Neither did I. And guess what? Somebody did. <laughs> you didn't have the option to be born here in the United States. You didn't have that option. You were born in the United States. Now, just think if you'd have been born in Haiti. Just think if you'd have been born in Calcutta. You're right. You didn't choose to be born. You didn't choose where to be born. Neither did I. Now you got to make the most of what you got. God's given you tremendous gifts. Use them well to glorify and honor him to serve people. Don't waste your gifts. You got a ton of them. Now, you also want to know why there's a hell? Yeah, sure. Because God is good. 
And because God is good, he cannot allow evil to win. You ever hear Billy Joel's song? Only the good die young? All right, Billy Joel, you're right. A lot of good people die young, don't they? And if there is no God, that's all there is to reality. And evil usually wins. Now, because God is good, he cannot allow evil to win. When I believe something, it's not a choice so much as, like, I feel like I can't help believe something. It's not like I could just one day choose to believe something. So how can you condemn someone for a belief? Fascinating point. Very good point. You're right. If you were to offer me $1 million, if I would believe that there's a pink elephant on your right hand, I could not do that, could I? I mean, sure, I would say to you, oh, yeah, I believe there's a pink elephant on your right hand. But I couldn't really believe that. Why? Because all the evidence is there is no pink elephant on your right hand. So you're right. Faith in Christ is not an issue of, I believe, I believe, I believe. Faith in Christ involves evidence. It involves trust. It involves truth. It involves knowledge. And that's why I stand here and say, read the Gospels for yourself. Go to the source documents. Read how did Jesus live? How did he teach? How did he die? How did he rise from the dead? Because you can't believe in a pink elephant. I don't care how much money I offer you. You can only believe something once you see the evidence is, wow, this might be true. I better check this out more carefully. So you're saying if anyone tries hard enough, they will end up believing? Correct. That's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus said, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door shall be open. See, but what about someone that doesn't have access to a Bible or totally different. the Word? You bet. Totally different. Great question. How is God going to judge those who've never had the opportunity to hear about Christ? I do not know. Because Christ never specifically addressed the question. But Jesus in the Bible makes five points that apply to that. First point. God's character is just. Nobody's getting ripped off. Everyone will be judged fairly and uniquely. Second point, nobody's going to hell because of ignorance. The only reason people go to hell is because they choose to live their life separate from God. And God grants their request. Third point, Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament lists the, a partial list of people who will be in heaven who obviously never heard about Christ. They were born hundreds of years before him. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Rahab, a Gentile prostitute. Never heard about Christ, obviously, but in humility, they put their faith in God. They're going to be in heaven.